Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgie Calvin-Smith. Tonight, Liberia's new president takes over, but Joseph Bwakai's inauguration speech is cut short as he appears to feel unwell during his swearing-in. Also, the U.S. Secretary of State kicks off a tour of the continent. Anthony Blinken heads from Cape Verde to the Africa Cup of Nations in Ivory Coast, where he witnesses his hosts suffer a brutal defeat at the hands of Equatorial Guinea. And Cameroon launches an historic nationwide malaria vaccine campaign, offering free routine jabs to children under six months. More than 80% of the 600,000 people killed by the disease every year are African children. But first, Liberia's new president faced a shaky start to his mandate as he was sworn in on Monday. The ceremony ended earlier than, it pl than planned as Joseph Wakai, who appeared to be unwell, had to leave the podium before he finished his speech. Laurent Berstecker with more. Your right hand, Freshly sworn in as Liberia's new head of state, Joseph Wakai already has his work cut out. The president will hope to redress a flailing economy and tackle widespread poverty in a country where over half of the population lives on less than $2 a day. I know what this country needs. I know what this economy can turn around. During his campaign, Boakai vowed to improve access to clean water and electricity, create jobs and lower the prices of essential products such as rice and fuel. He also pledged to improve infrastructure and build new roads, especially in the country's long-neglected south. But in order for these reforms to bear fruit and truly benefit the needy, Buakai will first need to address endemic corruption in Liberia, an issue which all of his predecessors vowed to tackle, yet the new president, who's promised a radical justice and security reform, hopes he can succeed where others failed. Buakai will be able to call on his experience and record. During his 40 years in politics, including 12 as vice president, he's managed to steer clear of corruption-related scandals. But time could also be working against the 79-year-old, who appeared visibly weakened during his swearing-in ceremony. Kate Verdi's Prime Minister met with the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, as he started a tour of the continent. Ulysses Correa e Silva met with Blinken early on Monday in the Cape Verdean capital of Praia. Now, Washington's top diplomats visiting four countries in Africa as his administration tries to push relationships with the continent further up the agenda. Amidst a turbulent diplomatic landscape, U.S. President Joe Biden failed to visit the continent last year, despite a pledge to do so. Nevertheless, Silvers said that he is still keen on strengthening those ties. I would like to express my gratitude for the support given during the COVID-19 pandemic. The vaccines that the United States of America gave to Cape Verde were decisive in this fight, and we responded very well. Cape Verde is one of the countries with the highest vaccination rates in Africa. The United States is committed to deepening, to strengthening, to broadening our partnerships across Africa, partnerships that benefit Africans and, uh, and Americans alike. As President Biden has said, we are all in when it comes to, uh, to Africa. Now, it was a whistle-stop stay in Cape Verde for Blinken. He's also due in Nigeria and Angola on this trip. But later on Monday, he moved on to Ivory Coast, where he got stuck into the excitement of the Africa Cup of Nations. Now, that's where our James Vazner has been following the tournament for us. And unfortunately, the game that Blinken attended turned out to be a painfully rough ride for his Ivorian hosts, who limped away with a shocking 4-0 loss to Equatorial Guinea. James tells us more. VIPs in the stadium in Abidjan, but all eyes were on the action on the pitch, or rather the lack of action uh, if it comes to the Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast would just completely battered tonight by Equatorial Guinea. Uh, a look of disbelief amongst all fans. They came into this knowing that they needed to try and go for that win to try and be sure that they'll make it through to the round of 16. But hopes very soon faded. The first goal came in, the second, that was where the mountain just seemed far too high for, uh, for the team to climb. Many supporters started leaving just a minute later. A third goal came in against them and the final one, the fourth, uh, that just led the stadium to empty uh, itself uh, very shortly before the end of the game. 
Felt like the final nail in the coffin, but really the second probably was that as it felt so hard for them. And Ivory Coast just had nothing going for them in front today. None of those opportunities taken. And what happens when you miss those opportunities? Well, you get punished. And that's exactly what happened from uh, Equatorial uh, Guinea. Punished multiple times. They pull off yet another fantastic display. It wasn't just about defending it. It seemed to be at the beginning of the game. It went on to scoring those goals and pull off another brilliant display uh, in this group stage. So it's going to be a long week ahead for the Ivorians as they wait to see how things pan out in the rest of the groups to see whether they can perhaps uh, qualify as one of the third best teams. But that seems like a very small chance. There's a very small chance that they will make it through. Uh, and if their journey does end tonight, well, it would have been a short one for the host nation. But they'll be hoping that there are still more days and more matches to come for them. Meanwhile, Nigeria's Super Eagles are through to the last 16 after beating Guinea-Bissau 1-0. They finished second in Group A behind Equatorial Guinea. Now, Mozambique faced Ghana at the Ebimpe on Monday as well. That's at, that game is at 90 minutes into extra time and the Black Stars are up 2-0. In Group B, Cape Verde went up against the heavyweights Egypt. Score there, one all into extra time. Well, Africa's turned a corner in the battle against malaria. Cameroon's become the first country to launch a nationwide routine vaccination program for the deadly disease. Most of the 600,000 people killed globally every year by malaria are under fives in Africa. The jab in Cameroon will be offered free of charge and systematically to all children under six months old. It's just a little prick of a needle that can save these children's lives. Here in Yaoundé, scores of infants are receiving their first injection of the malaria vaccine as part of Cameroon's new routine immunisation programme against the mosquito-borne disease, the world's first country to do so. Yeah. There are over half a million children who die every year in Africa because of malaria. And this is it. We're finally at the moment when this will be available in African countries. We decided to concentrate where the need was greatest, and Cameroon has a fairly high incidence, so that's really where the vaccine will have a positive impact. According to the World Health Organization, malaria kills around 600,000 people every year, mainly in Africa and children under five make up over 80% of that death toll. The malaria vaccine, named RTSS, has been nearly 40 years in the making. After successful pilot programs in Ghana, Kenya and Malawi, 18 million doses were made available to 12 countries. And researchers believe its effectiveness could be higher if given ahead of the malaria season. The malaria vaccines have been shown to reduce clinical malaria cases by more than half in the year after vaccination. And that level of efficacy goes up when the vaccine is provided seasonally. In that case, it prevents about three quarters or 75% of malaria cases. It's hoped 6.6 .6 million children will be immunized through 2025. Other African countries are aiming to follow suit with large scale rollouts this year, including Burkina Faso, Liberia, Niger and Sierra Leone. Well, over the weekend, Senegal's Constitutional Council published its final list of candidates eligible to run in the presidential election in February. A number of big names didn't make it, and Brad Peace talks us through. A record 20 candidates will take part in the presidential election here in Senegal next month, including for the first time ever two women candidates. Prime Minister Amadou Ba will be hoping to secure victory in the very first round of the election in order to avoid a runoff vote, which could be more difficult for him. Amadou Ba has the full backing of the current president, Macky Sall, but his chances of securing a first round majority are limited by the fact that a number of former senior government officials who also served under Macky Sall have declared their own dissident campaigns, which will likely cut in to Amadou Ba's vote share. Meanwhile, on the opposition side, the firebrand leader, Usman Sonko, has been rendered definitively ineligible by the Constitutional Council on account of the fact that he was found guilty for defaming a government minister. Sonko's party have named an alternative candidate, Basiro Jomai Fai, to represent them at the upcoming presidential election, although there is a hitch with that plan. Basiro Jomai Fai himself is currently in detention. 
A number of other pro Sonko candidates will also be taking part, and it's likely that come the day of the vote, they will coalesce around one single figure to maximise their chances of electoral success. While well, staying with Senegal, public transport's been given an upgrade, a new all-electric bus fleet's been brought in, the first of its kind in sub-Saharan Africa. Our team sent us this report. Senegalese President Macky Sall spared no expense in celebrating the inauguration. This fleet of electric buses is, after all, one of the flagship achievements of his second term in office, and the election is not far away. These buses consolidate our place in a new era of revolution in public transport, which will solve current problems and anticipate tomorrow's problems. New lines will cut travel time between Dakar city centre and the suburbs in half, with new lanes built exclusively for the buses. Some 300,000 people are expected to use the service every day. The buses themselves are powered with electricity generated from solar power. We will save about 59,000 tonnes of CO2 per year with these buses. That's a huge amount. In the 30-year lifespan of this project, we'll save 1.8 million tonnes of CO2. That's the equivalent of what would be produced by hundreds of thousands of regular vehicles. The Dakar region is home to nearly 4 million people a number set to double by 2040. Some experts believe these buses alone will not be enough to address future mobility needs. Our population is projected to be 7 or 8 million people in 15 or 20 years. It's good to come up with technical solutions and new means of transport, but what we really need is to move towards a decongestion of Dakar. Dakar residents will have to wait a couple of weeks before using the new service which will officially begin operating in February. Well, that's it for Iron Africa for now. But before we leave, a quick update on the score from AFCON. Mozambique's equalised with Ghana, two all, seven minutes extra time. And Cape Verde is one, Egypt, two, seven minutes extra time. That's it for Iron Africa for now. Thanks for joining us. Do so again if you can. Till then, take care. They're known for their cuisine and saying hello with a kiss. They only work 35 hours per week, when they're not on strike, that is. How true are these clichés about France? Every week, Florence Villeminot tears apart stereotypes. Join us for insight into French culture and current events to understand what makes the French so unique. French Connections, presented by Florence Villeminot on France 24 and France24.com.